Hello, hello, everybody. This is Wani Angere de Movie Cultures. Today, Friday, 11th of June. We don't know if it's morning, afternoon, or evening at the moment at the place where you are located. But doesn't matter because life is timeless. And today we have a very special guest. She is a combination of several cultures, I'll say, because she's Kenyan, Swazi, and she was also living in Canada for uh, several years. And her name is Fesile. How are you, Fesi? I'm good, Wani. I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Thank you for accepting our invitation to talk about unity and diversity. You know, it's our favorite topic. And uh, <laughs> yes, also is. talking about women and about empowerment and uh, opening spaces for people and communities to celebrate their origins and to celebrate their roots in relation with others. Who is Fessy? Um, like you said, um, Fezzi is was born in Kenya, and um, I have lived in, in in Kenya. I was also lived in Swaziland, so I, I think I'm a very good mixture of of uh, Kenya and Swaziland. But more than anything, I think I am I am a representative of what it means to be African. I think that is my greatest identity in the sense that you know when when you grow when you grow up when I was growing up in two African countries. Um, there was this sense where you were always this and another. And so we had to, when we were growing up, we always had to, we had to be very diplomatic and we had to be able to engage with different cultures. In, okay, one interesting thing, even though I'm Kenyan, I didn't grow up with my people. I come from the Wanga kingdom. I, I am, in another time, I would have been a, a princess. <laughs> Actually, my family is still the only royal family in uh, Kenya, so we are related to the Ugandan kings, uh, but we are we are the Luya kings, and we are called the Wanga Kingdom. Um, so I grew up with my people, but then I also grew up in 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 Nyanza Province back then. It was called Nyanza Province amongst the Luo people. My first 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 culture, I think, probably would have been the Luo culture. And so as a young child, I had to learn the language because when you go to the store, everybody speaks to you and say, you know, and you have to respond, you know. And then amongst my people, I grew up in a very cosmopolitan, it was amongst the Luya, but there were very many other tribes around because those were the, what were called the reserves of uh, Western Kenya in Kitale. And um, so we, we had all, all different tribes from, from amongst Kenya living together. And so we were very Kenyan more than we were Luya or anything. And so, and then, I, and then as a teenager, I grew up in Southern Africa and, and to them, they always, always, they always said to me, where are you from? I think maybe they, I look, maybe they look different, you know, a little bit of the Kenyan, but then my name is Swazi and it's very Southern African. And so I would say, my name is Fezile and they say, oh, great. And then they'll always ask you, and who do you belong to? Uwagabani means like, who, of who, who's, do, who's are you? And I would say, Wamukoya and they'd say, huh? Wagabani, because they, 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 my surname was very different. So you learn how to, you know, adjust and because we were always trying to fit in. But then it was it was very difficult as a young child not being. I always felt like maybe I was a half of this and half of that. But uh, later on, when I left the African content continent and I went to live in Canada, and all of a sudden, who I was as an African came really awake. You know, both as a Kenyan and as a Swazi. So. When you ask me who I am, I, I am an African woman. <laughs> Wonderful. This is a great way to start our conversation. Bessie, let's talk about the influence of your tribes because mm -hmm. it's very strong at the moment to really uh, understand the origins in order yeah. to go further and forward with whatever we have in life. What can you tell us about that? You know, um, I, they, they, I always tell the story of when I was a young child, I came from a very huge family. My grandfather had four wives. And uh, so one of my grandmothers, every time, so we, like, like most Kenyans, we all live in the city, but then your family is at home up country. And during the holidays, we always go back home. And so whenever I would go home, and I would, would walk into, the, into my grandmother's hut and she would immediately start singing to us. 
and each and every one of us had a song and and it's i think this is this is this is common amongst very many other african uh, cultures where we, we we sing praises you know and you know we, like in in uh, amongst amongst the southern african people this praises you sing to the king but they are family praises and in that praise the praises sing your identity they sing about your virtues they sing about your strengths they sing about their aspirations for who they think you are and who they want you to be and so um that's what I drew from my culture, from my father's side of the family. We were, we were, we were trained in who we were without it being something that divided us and separated us from, from the other people around us, from other Kenyans around us. You know, one of the things that is really important to me that is both in my cultures, both my Kenyan culture and my Swazi culture is this idea of, the, everybody in the world understands the idea of Ubuntu. In, in Swahili, we call it Utu. When you are raised to know who you are, you are raised in the full essence of who you are as a human being. And that means that whenever you engage with other people, you, the, you are expected to show those virtues, to show the strengths of who you are and to embrace other people. So in terms of my tribe and, and my, my, my background and, and a sense of belonging, it was not something that would separate me from other people. It was something that that made me understand where I come from, but made me curious and full of wonder about other people who are not like me. D does that make sense? Very much, Fessy, very much. And mm -hmm. I'm listening and I'm also checking some other notes from you. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense because it's mm -hmm. very much due, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So everything is uh, resonates and everything is uh, connected. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a guest here. Let me admit and mm -hmm. tell the person to keep the microphone mute. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Can you please uh, keep your mic mute to the new guest so we can continue with the interview with Fessy? Thank you. Fessy. So now that you are grounded yes. due to your history and the understanding of the community, mm -hmm. how do you translate that to the modern time? Because we have to talk about ancestrality and modern times. That's a very good question. And I think I can connect it to when I left the African continent and I went to North America and all of a sudden you you meet other people and if you in i mean talk about when you talk about modern times there's nothing more modern than living in you know in in north america and people were always curious about me as an african and were always asking me about where i came from and you know i would i would i would say i came from africa and they had certain ideas about what africa was i went to school we learned about other people. We learned about other countries. We, I remember as a child learning about the Palestinian situation in Yasser Arafat and, and Ronald Reagan. We, were, you know, we grew up in the 80s and the 90s. We were very, very connected to the things that were going on in the world. And as African young people, we wanted to contribute to, 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 the, to, the, to the stories of the world. I loved Christian Amanpour when I was a teenager. And I would watch CNN every day. And not so much because I wanted to see what was going on in the West, but she was a smart, intelligent woman. And she had a, she had a strange accent, you know? I could tell that she was from the West, but then there was something about her as well. And, 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 and I loved that combination. And, and I mean, I didn't even know that, I didn't even know what countries that she was from actually, until later on as, when I was an adult. And, and, I, and I like that there was, there's an instinctual pull towards maybe a figure like Christian Amanpour in that, you can be a mix of many different things and you can have you can represent many different backgrounds and cultures but you can speak and we live in the 21st century so what does it mean to be an african in the 21st century it means that we are strong we are powerful we are creative we have many ideas and i really really think like in terms of who we are and you know and this is a whole idea of ubuntu i think that's what we bring to the world in the 21st century when you look at some of the issues that people are facing the struggles we are going through it's a global struggle. It's not in the past, you know, it was Palestinian struggle. It was, you know, uh, West Bank or Gaza or Syria or Iraq, you know, uh, but now everything is interconnected. And 
we, 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 I don't know if I'm very young anymore, but <laughs> we African feel that there's a space that we have answers to some of the, some of the issues that the world is facing. And it doesn't always have to be problems. It, we just, we have contributions to make that are wonderful, that are wise, and that will push all of humanity forward. Yes, definitely. I think empowerment is the key word. Yeah. You know, empowerment in the sense that all this ancestrality now can be transferred with a more yeah. uh, logical uh, sense. Absolutely. Isn't yeah. it? And I think that when you think in 10, 20 years time and now, yeah. you can see that the empowerment really have give you the tools to become yeah. a better person. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, a yeah. better version of you. Yeah. So let's talk about one of my biggest passions is the Sangomas. Yes. I don't think many people understand what the Sangomas are and sometimes can be misunderstood. What mm -hmm. can you tell us about that? Well, you know, interesting. Uh, we both of us are musicians and within the name Sangoma is, is a song. Ingoma is a song. And in many of the Bantu languages, you'll find that word ngoma associated with music and drumming. And it says that within music and, and within the song is our spirituality. And the Sangomas particularly are, are the healers of Southern Africa, but you, anywhere you go across Africa, you'll find a version of Sangoma with different names. And Sangoma were the custodians of culture in that they were herbalists, they were also the custodian of some of the music in terms of spirituality. They carried the spirituality of the people. And so um, maybe, maybe in, modern, in modern times, um, some of us have, not, not all of us have, have, have kept the ancestral roots in the sense that we are, we are fully practicing our African traditions. But um, I, think, I think the idea of, of being healers, the, the, ideas, the idea of being custodians of culture, the ideas of being transmitters of what we were given from the past by our ancestors and we pass it on to future generation still exists all across Africa. And um, so, I mean, uh, plain and simple, a Sangoma is a healer. A Sangoma is, um, is a custodian of, of culture and, and spirituality within the African context. It's our African tradition. But I think I think we can look at that and, and you know look at it. We can we can make it bigger. We can expand it. We can we can look at it in different ways. Yeah, I think um, the Sangoma, as a practitioner, has also moved mm -hmm. to the health sector in a, yeah. in a more consistent way because uh, that tradition is alive. Is alive, and if you if yeah. the modern or the Western medicine needs to mm -hmm. connect with the people, they need to understand mm -hmm. the, the, the power of the Sangomas in the Southern African region, I would say, not only in South Africa, yeah, because yeah. like you say, there is still a very strong sense of uh, healers who are coming yes. from our ancestral knowledge. What experiences do you have at that level? Yeah. Okay, I think Fessy is always my internet is a little bit uh, frozen when uh, we are talking about, oh. yes, Fessy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I was trying to, uh, to connect the allopathic medicine, Western mm -hmm. medicine with the traditional healing sector. How do mm -hmm. you make the marriage of these two traditions? Actually, that's that's a very good question, and I think um, it. I don't think it should even it should even be um, it should be it should be so instinctual in all of us. It's interesting that you're asking me that question. Turns out, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, is a medicine. It was not her.
It looks like we lost the sound. Oh, yes. there you are. Are, you, are you back? Because also the internet yeah. is being frozen. Let's talk yeah. about the story of your grandmother. I can hear you now. Yes, thank you. Okay, I think we are still having a little bit of problem with the internet. I don't know if I'm the one who's frozen or is you who's frozen? I, I don't, I'm not sure, but um, I'm gonna maybe try to um, put it on um, uh, backup as well, so that I, in case it's me that I don't freeze again. Yeah. Okay, please, thank you, Tessie. So we yeah. were getting into a very exciting point of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was saying that my maternal grandmother was a medicine woman. She was not a sang woman as such. She was, she was not, she was not a spiritual, um, she didn't practice the spiritual aspect of it, but she was a herbalist. And my mother tells me that she used to, she was the woman that whenever the, any, any babies were sick, anyone six years and under, my grandmother was an expert in herbal medicines for looking after kids, any sort of uh, under, uh, uh, what do you call them? childhood diseases and sicknesses and she beautifully married she was able to marry western medicine and and uh and african herbal the herbal tradition she knew what what leaves were for what 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 trees were for what and uh i have also taken on that interest my mother was not very very interested in in, in the medicine but she always, she always used to say to me it's interesting you know you just you remind me of, of my mother and so there are some things that we just do every day, you know, like we, we, we drink certain herbs, we, we, we eat certain kinds of foods because that is health. We don't have to wait until we go to the doctor. And so we, we, uh, we, we learn certain interventions that we can use today. But I think there's a space and, and now more than ever, there's many people that have taken on an interest and they're beginning to actually systematically study it uh, from, from a Western perspective honoring the African cultures and marrying the two together so that we can, so that we can, um, we can benefit from both, from both schools of thought, because I think it really is about schools of thought. The pharmaceutical industry, I know, knows this and understands this, but of course, you know, a lot of, a lot of times they are in it for profit, but um, if we, maybe even as, as young people go to school and they can study and they can take it, they can take it to a place that maybe the pharmaceutical industry has not been able to take it yet. That's it. Now talking uh, again, because we've been connected for several years already, you know, I also did some discoveries lately because, uh -huh. uh, well, my, my grandmother was also uh, a herbalist. You know, she was, oh, wow. the, she was a, a, a person in charge of agriculture of uh -huh. the land and also it was the person who was dealing with the health of the people in the community. Uh -huh. where, uh, where I come from in Honduras, the Garifuna people from the village of my father. And yeah. the other day I found out that Sambula, that is the, mm -hmm. the family name of my father, is, mm -hmm. uh, is in South Africa, uh, it's a, a Chosa word, that means uh, the one who brings the light. Oh, oh. The, 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 the Sambula is like, or the one who enlighten it. No. Uh, so it, in 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 the in the, in the Kosa Zulu Siswati Sambulo is a psalm. It means like um, the opening. Yes. So you you can see the root where it comes from. Sambula. Yeah. Sambula. And doing all the research and connecting with some yeah. of my Myanmar colleagues here in Thailand, they were very close. They sent me the invitation for a puppet festival that was taking place in Myanmar. And they say they I noticed mm -hmm. there was a play called The Story of Sambula. And Sambula uh -huh. was a herbalist woman from the Benares time before Buddha, you know, wow. who was also a healer. <laughs> Look at and that. The meaning is exactly the same. So this is when you start to understand that it comes also from the Pali tradition. That is even yeah. before the Sanskrit in yeah. that area, because the world is one at the, at the end of the day. Absolutely. And yeah. it's so interesting how all that name belongs to my grandmother, who was a healer. You know, I'm also very much prone into uh, healing herbs and health and yeah. so on. And, uh, yeah. and this is how you open up to all these possibilities to create better energy for yourself yeah. and for the people around. 
Absolutely. So let's talk now about the power of the voice to mm -hmm. transform your own persona and other people. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I, maybe maybe bring you could, we could also again tie to the whole idea of sangoma in in, in, this, in the sense of music and healing. And um, actually, this is also a space that scientists are also studying that there are frequencies and there are vibrations that you can use and they will do different things to the human body, to the human psyche, to our neurology. And so with music, I mean, if you, if you think about some of the way, even not just in Africa and many traditions around the world, there are rhythms and there are patterns and there, and the way we play the drums that affect us in certain ways, right? So the voice is such a powerful tool. The voice is a powerful tool to bring healing, to bring restoration. Our words are powerful tools. I really, really believe that what you say is, we have the, 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 the power of life and death is in my, in my, in my tongue, in what I speak. And, and, and we, I can connect that to how we name people within our cultures. Uh, if you meet a lot of people from Southern Africa, many people's names have actual meanings. And, and those meanings contain, again, the hopes and aspirations of the people. And so, and they always carry a blessing. And many times, whatever your name is, is who you become. Like, for example, you'd say your family was called Sambula. So you guys were, the, you were the family of healers. And maybe like you, one, you didn't study uh, herbs and plants, but you took that and you made it, and you've brought healing through voice, through the power of sound. And I, and, and I know you very well. And I've also gone to know a lot of the people that know you. And everywhere where Wani goes, life just springs up. And you know, I can think of some of the projects that we did together. And I remember when they were when they just started, and then when they grew, and it was all around music. It was all around the power of voice and sound. I, you know, again, I can even speak to when we would have conversations, and and I, I can remember some of the conversations we would have with different people, and you were, and you're calling them out, and you're telling them who they are. Yes, you spoke it, but you also demonstrated it. And you know, I remember when we were in Sudan together and we were singing and there was, and we were, mini, uh, uh, we were, um, I was going to say ministering, it's a spiritual term to, <laughs> to, to, to the women of Sudan. And, and you could see the atmosphere was so powerful, but peaceful and beautiful. And we, and, 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 and something happened in that atmosphere and all the women became one. And there was so much love that we, was released in that atmosphere. And, and and interesting also the, we were the, we were women and most of them were women but I remember the, the men I remember when Dan was singing and and he was releasing the power of sound and and it didn't matter that he was a man there was a blessing that he released to the women in this very special feminine space as a man that he could that they were able to receive and and so I mean we can just go on about the power of voice <laughs> in so many ways you know <laughs> yeah. I see. Yes, mm -hmm. we started with the conversation about identity, ancestrality, the mm -hmm. marriage between all these different traditions and also timings, the, the healing power of herbs and health, and now mm -hmm. the voice. Yeah. Let's talk about how all these elements into mentorship are transforming communities. There you are. <laughs> uh, I was asking you how we can uh, now share some information about mentoring and all those different aspects we uh, just talk about. Okay. Um, in terms of, maybe I can talk about maybe what I do. Um, in terms of what I do in, uh, in mentoring, I, I, I felt that it was very important to carry what we know to the next generation. So for me, particularly, I, I, I chose to work with younger people and I chose to work around the arts. I mean, I started off with music as my art because that's where I where that's my area of expertise, so to speak. But I work with other artists the same way we're talking about the power of voice. There's the power of, of sound and vision and, and, and music and movement. And, and Wani, you, you know this because you're a dancer as well. And and so um, I felt it was very important to gather around me a, a, a group of people who, who think like me and who feel the same way as me 
so that we can begin to train the next generation in this. And so that these things that we know don't get lost. You know, for me, my grandmother sang it to me and I learned about it through my grandmother. But then uh, my grandmother doesn't live in the same context that I live. She, they have since both, or they've all since passed away. But we can do for the next generation what our grandmothers did for us. And so I started a program uh, uh, called Kitovu, where, where we brought children under, un, under one umbrella, under the arts, and we, and we trained them in music and instruments. And, and, and my, some of my friends trained them in art and, and, and sports. Sports is also healing, this, this power in it. You know, the Greeks did the Olympics, but it's not just about you know, competition. It does something to, 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 to the human psyche, the, you know, your physicality, your health. You know, it's more than running around playing football. It's about who are you here and who are you here? And how do you contribute to society? Use your power and your strength. Find your power and your strength. Find it here, you know, find it here and find it within your body. And then um, you, you, have been a, you have been a great mentor in, in the musical space. And we are not, we don't live in the same country anymore, but we continued what you taught us in, 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 in using music for healing and, and going to different, different spaces. And, and particularly we, we used to go to the hospital uh, just as COVID was breaking out once a week. And, and incidentally, we used to go to the women's ward and we would again sing and use the power of music to just raise their, 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 as, their affect, you know, their, their, their psychology and, 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 um, and, and, and so we, we were doing it, but other people are watching us and other people also want to be a part of what we do. And that's where mentorship comes in. Sometimes it can be a formal uh, situation where you go and look for somebody and say, may I sit at your feet and learn from you? But I think mentorship can also be community sharing, learning from one another, allowing each other into each other's spaces. It doesn't always have to be formal, but it always has to be intentional. We always have to be doing it. We always have to be passing on, giving ourselves, multiplying ourselves. Otherwise, what we know will die with our generation. Very powerful. Bessie, and now that we're talking about the power of music, would you like to sing something for us? We are almost reaching the 30 minutes with you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I hope it will come through well in Zoom, but I, I'll, I'll try to sing a fun, a fun song. <laughs> And it's a song about cows, and and cows are very important to my 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 Southern African people, and cows are also very important to my Kenyan people, and so it's a song I, I like to teach the kids, and uh, it, it goes like this. <laughs> Yo 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 inama pondo incomino pondo incomino pondo Okay Fessy now we have a video that we like to share with the audience about your participation in the Ongea festival as a member of Moving Cultures let me go with it okay Let's see it sound So and I'll speak to my my myself. I think as I think I'm, I'm a very Pan African a, a, African because of my parents coming from different countries. So even from just within the African context itself, from a very early age, I was always living in two cultures. I was living in an African culture, but I was living in two cultures in terms of who we were in the house: my mother's culture and my father's culture. And then. Uh, in my position as a member of our big umbrella movement, uh, Moving Cultures, and our motto is Unity in Diversity. So as a young child, I saw what it can look like to be to belong, to belong to a Kenyan father and to belong to a Swazi mother. And to have even, even the sounds of music coming from different parts of Africa, all of them happening at once in my reality. So, uh, I, saw, I saw them unified, I didn't see a clash, I didn't see opposition. Now if you ask me, when I was a child, uh, they used to, everyone used to laugh at me because they used to say, well, you're not really Kenyan, and when I go to Swaziland, you're not really Swazi. You always belong in, in different places, or you never do really belong. So, tying into what Sergio was saying with globalization, 
I think we live in a generation where we decide who we are. We decide uh, what our culture is going to be. Our, the, our predecessors, people who have lived in the past, have given us a reference in terms of sound, in terms of language, in terms of uh, buildings, in terms of everything that, con that connotes culture. But we are living in a world where information is available at your fingertips. We are very exposed. So how do we leverage what has passed from the past and define who we are today? If you speak to young Kenyans, I have teenagers, uh, I, 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 I mentor young girls, and I, and I also run a children's choir, and I'm also a musician within the context of music uh, uh, moving cultures, where last night you heard Wani and uh, Catalina, they were singing music from Honduras, from Cuba, but with very, very strong Afri African influences with an electric guitar. We live in such a globalized, such a melange, such a mix, Part of the discussion we're having in the back about what it means to, to be contemporary is what is contemporary? And I think personally, my example says I decide. I'm Kenyan. Come and talk to me if you don't think I'm Kenyan. But I'm Swazi, I'm African, I'm international. So I don't think that we compromise um, our heritage and an identity living in a contemporary world. I think it enhances, and like Serge was talking about, it brings out the best in who we are and what has been passed on to us from generations past. Everybody knows, has every, can you put up your hand if you've heard about the, the reed dance in Swaziland with, that King Swazi holds every year? Okay, only two people, well, many more. So the reed dance is basically a, a celebration where young girls come from all over the country and traditionally what they used to come and do was to repair the queen mother's hut. But it's a time of dancing and celebration and uh, uh, Herman was talking about the influence of uh, certain kinds of music on TV with a lot of half-dressed, naked young women. Now in the re-dance, when they, when they dress, they wear a very tiny little skirt here. And that's it. They don't wear anything else. Their breasts are exposed. Every, all, all, everything in their anatomy is exposed. But if you look at how girls dance in a hip-hop um, uh, um, um, video, video and how you see, and if you see all these thousands of young Swazi girls who are dancing with reeds and they're doing the traditional Swazi dances, the message that is coming in both contexts are very different. Should we throw away the reed dance because of what is happening in hip hop? In my opinion, growing up in Swaziland, to me, it is a celebration of womanhood. I have a choir of young girls. I want them to know what it means to be African, to be strong, to be powerful, to be knowledgeable as a young African woman, and to embrace everything that we are without losing our sense of dignity. When people come, people have heard many different commentaries about the re and people say, oh, it's pornography, it's this and that. I think it's pornography if you view it as pornography, and depending on and, and maybe the place where you're coming from. But when you come to Swaziland and see how it is held, you decide, you decide. Those young girls are not coming to dance and to, to, to show pornographic images. They're coming to celebrate their sense of self, their sense of identity as young Swazi girls. And when I was growing up, the songs used to be very different. The messages were very different. Uh, still always pertaining to my life as a young woman, my life as a young woman living in Swaziland. Young teenagers today are still singing the same message of womanhood, of identity, of sense of self. But as they dance, they do the traditional dances and they'll throw in a dub in the middle of it. That is their expression. Is it less traditional or is, is it not culture because they're expressing themselves that way? Okay, Fessy. Is less traditional or oh, what is the story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I that think it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to do a closure of this conversation. It started with the same message and we're ending with the same message. Like I say, you are very much yourself and very authentic on, on your life and also on the message you deliver. You do and you say and you express the same message and that makes it stronger and louder. Yeah, so it's not need to, to go and pray because you really represent what your beliefs are. Pessy, can you please give us a last message 
for the general public? Yeah, um, again, <laughs> we, we live in an, a very interesting time, you know? The last two years have been very difficult in terms of the pandemic, but they have been incredible opportunities for us to show who we are. There have been incredible opportunities for inventions to come from all over the world, you know? Um, the, the, the many, many people in the world are getting vaccinated and, and, and this vaccine you know, came very quickly. But I think there are also opportunities in terms of some of the things we were talking about. We we're talking about, um, about, about, herb, about herbs, about, about African knowledge. You know, what would it look like if we as one world, if we in the world sang that one song, that one song of healing? Is it possible to get rid of COVID-19 through the, the power of sound? Maybe not even in music, although if you ask me, I think that you know, we could tap into things that we have never thought possible. But what, what is the one sound that we are making across the world that, is, that should reverberate, you know? Should, you know, we saw India struggle. India, you know, India broke our heart, we wept. We all wept with India. How do we help each other so that that never happens again? We all wept with Brazil, we wept with Italy. We, you know, we saw the dead bodies. What can we do together? and say that never again may we never ever see such a thing may we never see war may we never see children being trafficked may we ne never see women being oppressed i think it's possible i think it's possible because i exist i think it's possible because of because i got to meet wani and and many of the people that who are in our circle in and many of the people who are in our i will call it a movement and i call it a movement because it's again the power of of sound you know it is, it is not static, it's not closed. It, it's always, it's, it, it, it can grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And like I said, you know, that was a few years ago, I was much younger, but I still, I still believe we decide, we choose, and let us choose wisely and let us choose each other. Thank you, Fessy. And as you mentioned, Moving Cultures is actually a movement, it's a social platform where we are celebrating unity and diversity, empowering others to continue with the message of transformation and well-being. Our next guest is from Philippines. His name is Paul Gallanilo. He's an opera singer, a pianist, clarinet player, and a mentor and educator. So in a few minutes, we're going to be with him. And we once more, going to bring the people to the gallery, are going to say thank you, thank you very much to Fessy for her participation, her message, her love, and her commitment with the communities around the world. This is Wani Angeder from Moving Cultures, Cultural Stopovers, and Women of the World, Talk and Act. Fessy, blessings and all the best. See you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.